unity and particularly your take on the United States of America. Are we actually going to be more government centric? Are we going to push back against the ethos of Ronald Reagan? I think you probably are. Um, I'm less expert, obviously, on the United States than I am on the UK. But I would have thought that the the knee-jerk rhetoric that says, uh, you know, we need uh, as little government as we can, the jokes about saying, you know, I'm from the government, I'm here to help you, that doesn't sound <laughs> like a joke now. But that, yeah. that, that sounds uh, as if that's actually serious. Um, and I think that will create a sense among the population, not those people who had their minds up uh, several centuries ago, they won't change, but there'll be a lot of people in the middle who say, well, do you know what? This government, you know, do we want to ridicule all these pointy heads within the beltway? Or are they sometimes useful when the economy really falls into trouble? So I do think there will be a change in, in rhetoric. But, of course, it will depend on how effectively the government is seen to have responded. And that looks rather different from place to place, I think. There will be a change in business and how we do business, and that's for sure, Howard. I love your insight on how the United Kingdom will change in the years to come, particularly with banking. Now, for many people listening to this program in the United States, retail banking in the UK has changed radically in the last couple of decades. You walk into a bank branch now and you'll see very few people, a lot of machines, very few people. And the machines are now doing the day-to-day transactions that I think a lot of people are still depending on people for in America. Howard, does that just accelerate that trend in the UK and beyond? Is there something new, a new world of banking that we need to consider just in terms of your day-to-day operations and how you use people? Yes, that's, uh, the short answer to that question is yes. The uh, crisis has meant that a lot of people have switched to digital banking who did not wish to do so before. Now, the millennials have already done that. That's not news to them. But we had quite a lot of older customers who found this rather frightening and intimidating. And they are now switching um, because they've had to. And they are switching uh, quite quickly. So. We are going to see an acceleration of the trend towards remote banking, and in due course, that will undoubtedly alter things quite a bit. But I guess also the interesting thing about the competitive dynamic is that we have got quite a lot of new ventures, new fintech companies, new digital-only banks, etc. Some of them are well-funded and will survive this crisis and come out stronger, and some will fall by the wayside. So I think we will see an altered competitive environment in two ways. One, it will be more digital, but two, some of the marginal players, I suspect, will find it difficult to survive. Howard, fantastic to get your thoughts this morning. Really appreciate it. Thanks for joining us. So Howard Davis there, RBS chairman, joining us on the latest with the job situation and the future of banking as well in the UK and beyond. The job situation is a dire one. The future, it is all about the future now, the recovery, the reopening and how quickly we can heal a damaged labour market. Right now, your equity futures roll over just a touch. Positive 12 points on the S&P 500, up four tenths of 1%. A couple of days of gains on the S&P. We could add to that at the opening bell. Yields higher by two basis points on a US 10-year. Your yield on a 10-year maturity, 0.68%. From New York, alongside Tom Keane, I'm Jonathan Fe- Why do hedge funds and other alternative managers rely on Pershing for a highly personalized experience? Mark Alderati, a managing director at BNY Mellon's Pershing and head of Prime Services, explains. In today's fast-paced environment, where the only constants are change and volatility, you need a prime broker who's both steady and agile, focused on supporting your needs so that you can focus on growing your business and producing results. Exceptional client service and advocating for our clients is at the core of what we do. Our award-winning high touch team is just one of the benefits of working with BNY Mellon. We help alternative investment managers create great experiences for their clients. Whether it's customized financing, securities lending solutions, platform access, or outsourced trading, BNY Mellon's Pershing is a prime broker who's committed to this business and dedicated to meeting your evolving demands. To learn more about the unique and industry-leading solutions for hedge funds and other alternative managers, visit Pershing.com. Pershing LLC. Member FINRA, NYSE, SIPC. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then go to Babbel.com, download the app, 
and try it for free. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just go to babbel.com and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or go to babbel.com and try it for free. That's B A B B E L.com. This is a blue. This is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, as well as the coronavirus job retention and self employment income support schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. Did you know that Players of People's Postcode Lottery have raised over £500 million for charities and good causes? They've also won £63 million in prizes so far this year, and it could be your postcode next. Visit postcodelottery.co.uk slash radio before midnight on the 21st of May to play in the June draws. PPL manage lotteries on behalf of good causes 16+. plus. Conditions apply. Play responsibly. Somebody has a stroke every five minutes in the UK. With time, though, courage and the right support, lives can be rebuilt. Mine was. But with this current crisis, I can't imagine how much harder it must be for the stroke survivor and their family, more isolated and alone than ever. The Stroke Association is working tirelessly to support the NHS and develop new ways to rebuild lives. To find out more or to donate, search Stroke Association now. Get your cook on with Asda with Butcher Selection Quarter Pounder Beef Bourbons. Get a four pack for just £2.28. And Salmon Phillips. Get a two pack for only £2.97. So dinner's always a winner. At Asda, we're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asda. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. Live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York, Bloomberg 1130, to Washington, D.C., Bloomberg 991, to Boston, Bloomberg 1061, to San Francisco, Bloomberg 960, to the country, Sirius XM Channel 119, and around the globe, the Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. From New York City, this is Bloomberg Surveillance for our audience worldwide. We are live on Bloomberg Radio, one hour away from the open. And Bell Equity Futures positive 13 off the highs and up by 0.45% in the bond market. Treasury set up as follows your 10 year yield up three basis points to 0.695%. And I know this is a story that Lisa has been following. Treasury refunding day this morning, Lisa, and the headlines just across the Bloomberg. Yeah, people looking for that 20-year guidance as well. And frankly, uh, we're looking at $20 billion of issuance of 20-year bonds in the first sale. I'm curious as to what the liquidity is going to be, given the fact that there isn't an ecosystem of trading around this debt that's being reintroduced for the first time since the 1980s. A question here. You're going to get a record $96 billion of 3, 10, and 30-year debt in the refunding as well. Tom, these numbers are just numbers we've never seen before. Just yeah. absolutely unbelievable. So if I buy a, tw- is a 20-year a bond or a note? If I buy a 20-year bond, I'm trying to do, what, what kind of coupon am I going to get on that? Right now, just a guess, if your 10 years is about 70 basis points and your 30 years 140, I'd say something like 100, something you like that. You want Tom? me to tie up money for 20 years for a percentage point Something in and around that kind of level, yeah. Not, you're not, they're not taking it. Someone's no, taking. Just don't someone's, get it. someone's offering up thirty-year money at one point three seven percent. Tom, so you know, we make, we're making jokes about it, but the answer is it's going to sell out in three seconds, right? Yeah, probably. Maybe. Probably, I'd expect this debt to get sold. I don't expect a failed auction at this twenty-year. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I mean, oh, I imagine love if, it. when the, when the yeah. Treasury supplies the debt, it usually gets bought. <clears throat> 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's fascinating. Frankly, it's I'm, I've been surprised that the U.S. hasn't raised more debt in the long-term market for, for all of this time. For the past few months, they've been financing themselves through the bills market. And there's a question, when you can borrow for 1% for 20 years, why not do it? Yeah, it's been a big debate. Peter Fisher's led that debate now at Blackstone and up at Tuck at Dartmouth. And he's been real articulate about why we don't want to issue 50-year bonds. I, I have to admit, Lisa, I've never understood it. John, what do they do in, in England? Do they still have that perpetuity stuff that's in the Dickens? Diff, different investor universe, Tom. Different investor universe. You've got to think about the amount of pension money that really wants the long duration <clears throat> gilt. And that's why the gilt market. So the DMO which is basically the, the office that manages the auctions and the duration yeah. of the particular tenors and how much they issue and all of that stuff, they usually lean heavily on the long end because there is such huge pension demand for it. It's just a different kind of market right. compared to treasuries. Do you have a perpetuity bond? I, I mean, don't I know. I see you the one. I don't. I, I would love one of those old school gilt edge certificates. From yeah, exactly. Hotel. It just sounds so romantic. I can see you like in Mary Poppins, you know, railroads to India. It works out. Let's do this, folks. We've had a really interesting set of guests today from the early morning hours. And, of course, we're centered on the labor economy. Let us go granular to the market economics of the moment. We can do that with Stephen Gallagher of Society General. Stephen, I guess ADP comes on plan. You're going to look at claims. You're going to look at the jobs report. What should I our audience look for? What's going to be the distinction, the tilt point, the surprise of the coming two days of data? Well, it, they're horrible numbers. I mean, they're just off the chart um, records being set. Uh, they're depression uh, employment numbers. Going more granular, I, I'm not really Please. sure. I mean, we, we can try to like dice it up, I mean, but the headlines, the top rate, the 14, 15% unemployment rate, 20 million people losing their jobs. I mean, it already launches so many policy responses. It warrants why we've done what we've done in terms of blowing up the deficit. You saw the Treasury financing the deficit this morning. But you know, why these are happening is precisely because we've just lost 20 million jobs. And, that, and we're just looking for more confirmation on that. Stephen, this market is struggling to absorb numbers this large. Just as people trying to process the data, and Tom and I touched on this earlier, it was something Mohammed Alarian brought up a number of weeks ago. The cognitive limitations of just individuals to process numbers this big. How do you do that, Stephen? It, you know, that it's a great question. When I first started contemplating these numbers, I, you know, I thought, it can't be possible. These are people starving in the street type numbers. We've never seen it. I've never seen it. Um, and, and, and at first I rejected it, but within days I saw my local soup kitchens with just lines. And then a few days later, I'm seeing on the newspaper or in the t TV, just car lines and lines of people picking up the free food. So we are seeing something we've never seen before. We, we've seen pictures of the depression soup kitchens. It's, it's happening right now. They're just... Your cars picking up these nice clean boxes or social distancing while they're standing in line. But, but it's happening. And, and, you know, again, when we think about the policy responses and we think about these trillions and trillions of dollar deficits, I mean, th this is the reason for it. It's the human tragedy in, in these employment numbers that we're looking at is exactly the, you know, that in between, you know, what's going on, how it's affecting people, families, why we're getting the, the responses we're getting from Washington that we're getting, you know, such a divided Washington, yet, you know, we got to be amazed by what yeah. they've been able to put through as quickly as they've done. And Stephen, I will say that the soup kitchen near me, the food bank, also uh, lines around the block and getting longer uh, with each day. I'm wondering, we were talking earlier, Tom raised the point, who would buy 20-year treasuries at a 1% rate? And you have to think, with all of these people losing their jobs, the demand shock has just been catastrophic. People don't have money to buy stuff. And this is deflationary. I'm wondering how long this sort of deflationary kind of spiral you expect to last in the United States. It, it, you know, that's definitely something we're, we're working on now and looking at, I mean, certainly for the next couple of years. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at rates of inflation plunging below 1%. You know, the Fed wants to keep it at 2% and puts up these soft guardrails at 1.5 to 2.5. We're, we're going to get something below 1% for a sustained period of time. Now, a lot of that's energy and oil. 
Uh, but still, even stripping that out, we're, we're going to be challenged, you know, around the 1% level on inflation for, for a while with these types of numbers. We see it in airlines, travel, accommodation, um, <coughs> stores trying to get customers back into the shop. Right. They're going to have to do a lot of discounting to attract customers again. Stephen Gallagher uh, with the uh, French Bank Society General with us. Stephen, everyone in the street knows Sakjen has had a heritage of caution. You people were absolutely brilliant in 08, 09, uh, 10 with your reticence about economic growth. What's your reset number for the American economy? When we get through this, I'm not even going to ask, are we going to see 3% GDP? But what kind of number would you frame for us? A uh, two, or are you going to be gloomy and go to a one handle? I'm going to be gloomy. I hate being gloomy, but uh, I think we're going to be under 2%. Uh, you know, if we, we had our potential growth rate right around 2% before this, this crisis happened, right? I think we're, we're going to be below <clears throat> okay. 2% going forward. And this is so important, folks, just because of time, I want to I want to be sure, Stephen, that we carry this forward to like chapter 21 that nobody reads in a basic economic textbook. If you have a persistency of 2% or lower GDP, do you flip the bond yield there and come up with a huge multiple for equity ownership? I mean, is can you say the new normal in the equity market is a 20 multiple or a 22 multiple? I, you know, that is exactly the kind of math, and, and, a, and it's one of the reasons why the equity market is doing so well. So the discount factor is tremendously positive for the equity market, and why we're you know, seeing, I guess, a rush back in. I'm still worried about the earnings. I, you know, even the multiple is, is, you know, yes, it's going to be higher. Simply, you know, you, you did the math with the, the bond yield, so the multiple is going to be higher going forward. Uh, but the earnings just don't look good to me for for some time, and I'm and I'm struggling on on being positive, you know, with such a bleak uh, earnings trend. Stephen, fantastic to get your thoughts, sobering thoughts too. Stephen Gallagher, there of Sogjian, the chief U.S. economist. Lisa, quick question from me, and I just wonder, and I don't want to get you in trouble with any bond investors out there that might be on the Treasury no, we want that. Advisory Committee. But did the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee just lose the argument that they've been pushing for a long, long time? The, the argument as to... Uh, the argument being don't issue the longer term stuff, don't term out the debt, keep issuing bills, keep things as they are. Let's see what happens. I think a lot of people are still uh, predicting that bond yields could rise in the not-so-distant future, especially if the Federal Reserve starts to sell these longer-dated treasuries. But yes, and, and there's a question, and frankly, one of my big questions for the year is 100-year debt. How long will it be before we start hearing about plans to issue that? People saying that there isn't necessarily going to be the ecosystem of trading around it, but honestly, the 50-year bond, why not, right? Why not push out maturities as long as possible? Why keep rolling? things over at a time of uncertainty. These are the questions that the Treasury is facing. And yes, all the people who pushed back and said this was not appropriate, they've lost. Curve steeper. Yields up five basis points now in the 10-year. The 30-year up around about six basis points. Some real mm -hmm. curve steepening off the back of this, Tom, as we shift some of this extra issuance out from the bill market over to the Treasury market at the long end. There's no question about it. I mean, it's widely predicted. Uh, Robert Lloyd Skidelsky was on just adamant in his reading of history. He's one of our great historians, is that you get to a point of higher yields and all those indications of inflation to come. Let's get some news, some headlines worldwide. We can do that this morning with Michael Barr. Good morning, John, Lisa, Tom. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo says the national debate over when to reopen outbreak-ravaged economies boils down to the value placed on people's lives. Political pressure is intensifying to relax restrictions that have kept people at home and off the job. Cuomo says he will not be pressured to reopen his state. Do you just open the gates or do you do it intelligently? And what we're doing in this state, we're talking about reopening, but reopening intelligently, reopening based on facts and data. Cuomo has opted for a slower approach that will allow parts of the state to phase in economic activity and later this month, if they meet, and maintain benchmarks. Amazon says a New York employee who worked in a Staten Island warehouse died from COVID-19. It has heightened concerns among workers that the online retail giant isn't doing enough to protect those who are through the pandemic. Thousands of workers in meat and poultry plants across the U.S. have been sickened by the novel coronavirus. Some industry insiders predict it will affect the supply chain and therefore the price of meat. 
Nationwide production of beef and pork is down and wholesale meat prices are rising. Mark Lordson is with the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union. He told ABC the workers need proper PPE and daily testing. I tell people if you really truly want to make the food supply chain in this country safe, you have to start by making those workers safe because without those workers, our supply chain is broken. Lauritsen says there needs to be one set of safety rules for all plants. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. John. Michael Barr, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. So I stand corrected, Lisa, this time. The Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee at the most recent meeting apparently suggested terming out the bill issuance and pushing it out. Yeah, yeah. And it looks like the Treasury actually made a move this time with the nod coming from the Treasury Borrowing Advisory Committee. So a big change all round here on issuing on the longer end. Which, again, raises questions about a 50-year or 100-year issuance. And I will say a listener writing in, does a 50-year bond lead to 40 to 50-year mortgages, which could lower payments and provide another boost? Another thing to consider as we start thinking about decades ahead and pushing out maturities. But again, I think really important, John, to your point about the steepening of the yield curve. At what point is this going to provide uh, a bit of a headwind? How much is this going to potentially uh, eat into a recovery if it continues to steepen dramatically? So the story, and we knew the story already, is that the Treasury would be issuing more debt. Where on the curve would they issue it? We find out this morning. Down on the longer end, yields up six basis points on a 30-year, on a 10-year up five basis points, and on a two-year we go absolutely nowhere. Much more still to come on a bond market and the earnings from the Walt Disney Company as well. That's just around the corner. From New York, this is Bloomberg Surveillance. And we're live on Bloomberg Radio. This is your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. You might think demand for commercial real estate is going to slip because, you know, large corporations are now way more comfortable with that whole work-from-home thing than they used to be. That's a very rapid and a very interesting and actually, I think, a very lasting change that is going to influence our workplaces. But on the other hand, some say that that doesn't mean demand for office space will actually drop. Sanjay Rishi is CEO of Corporate Solutions at commercial real estate company Jones Lang LaSalle. Social distancing is going to require more square footage, more space. And Rishi says, after all, humans are social animals and office space does provide the opportunity for human contact. You do want a level of a sense of belonging Uh, that is created when you go into the workplace. And tomorrow we'll take a look at some of the physical changes you should expect to see in offices in the coming months. And that's your Bloomberg Real Estate Report. I'm Denise Pellegrini. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, makes innovation happen. The university helped biomedical engineering professor Tara Alvarez launch a startup that may revolutionize vision therapy. Our startup through NJIT is called Ocular Motor Technology. We create virtual reality vision therapy in a head-mounted display. So it's gaming and basically we're sugarcoating the therapy so that children and young adolescents don't even realize they're doing therapy. To accomplish this, we need biomedical engineers, which are here on NJIT campus, computer scientists, artists, people that are into story development. And then we are collaborating with a lot of the large pediatric medical centers. This idea of a startup culture is extremely important to not just NJIT and the National Science Foundation, but also to the U.S. as a societal whole. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Connecting decision makers to a network. Hey, it's Jacoby here from Jalen Jacoby. And after you watch The Last Dance on ESPN, which you're obviously going to do just like the rest of us stuck in our homes in quarantine, you can join Jalen Rose and I for Jalen Jacoby, The After Show. And we will be joined by the director of the documentary series, Jason Ayer, to discuss each episode in detail. You can hear our after show right here on ESPN Radio on Sunday nights after the episodes air. And they'll be available on the Jalen and Jacoby podcast feed. Search Jalen and Jacoby to listen today. Stay on top of everything happening in the pro wrestling universe with the Body Slamming Podcasts on TuneIn. For passionate recaps of the most recent SmackDown to a pro wrestler's perspective on life and culture at large, search sports and scroll down to the world of wrestling to listen. 
You love tuning for live breaking news from CNN, MSNBC, Fox, CNBC, and more. But when you can't catch your favorite show as it airs, it might just be a click away as a podcast. Search your favorite news station to explore all the on demand news shows on TuneIn. In case you didn't know, TuneIn lets you listen to the same radio stations you pick up on your home or car radio, except you can hear them from anywhere. If you want to find a station from somewhere else in the world, navigate to the By Location section under Browse. Keep exploring with TuneIn. Today at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business App, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. Treasury Secretary Stephen Mnuchin increasing the amount of debt he plans to issue in quarterly refunding auctions to a record high of $96 billion to provide government funding as the economy heads into a recession caused by the coronavirus. Washing shares of General Motors up 6% in early trading after it reported better than expected quarterly earnings on booming sales of new pickup models. Employment at U.S. companies plummeting in April by the most in records back to 2002 as coronavirus mitigation efforts brought business activity to a near standstill. Private payroll slumping by 20.2 million from a month earlier. That according to ADP Research Institute. Futures this morning are higher. S&P futures up nine and a half points. Dow futures up 81. NASDAQ futures up 42. The 10-year treasury is down 17 30 seconds. The yield 0.71 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.19 percent. And J.P. Morgan strategist Don Norman tells us equities are priced over optimistically. It's going to be an extremely abnormal recovery, meaning it's going to take years to recruit the lost output and the lost jobs. And that usually equates to uh, a multi-year process of recouping the lost profits. NYMEX crude oil is down more than 6.5%. It's down $1.63 at $22.95 a barrel. COMEX gold down 7 tenths percent or $11.20 at $16.99.50 an ounce. The euro 1.0818 against the dollar. The yen 106.15. And that's a Bloomberg business flash. Bloomberg opinion, informed perspectives, and expert data-driven commentary on breaking news. Good morning, everyone. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keen. Bloomberg Surveillance, of course, focused on the labor economy, ADP, Grimm, and on survey. And, of course, we go to claims tomorrow and then the jobs report on Friday. Walt Disney Company has been looking at jobs, and they have been cutting them. They're really, like everyone else, looking at expense control. Uh, it is a little bit different than we've heard from Walt Disney for years. Alec Webb follows uh, Disney with Bloomberg Opinion, but far more Alex Webb follows the whim of content and how we invent content. Alex, I want to get away from margins, buy, hold, sell, and with you talk about this phrase, content is king. Is that going to be true in the future for Walt Disney? It certainly looks to be their lifesaver right now. There still remains quite a lot of debate over whether uh, the streaming services that are becoming ubiquitous, not least led, led by Netflix, of course, whether they do have uh, the kind of margin profile, I'm sorry that does return to your to your, to your bugbear, but um, whether they are profitable in the long term. Now, Disney, of course, their model is a little bit different. Content is in some ways a, a tool for gearing people towards other products, not least their theme parks, and um, the theme parks are inevitably the thing that are taking the hit right now. One thing that struck me about Disney's earnings were the multi-pronged approach that Disney has taken to its business. It has the theme parks and the cruise lines, which saw more than a month of business just absolutely eradicated. And there is plan. Uh, there is a plan to reopen some of the theme parks, although there is a question of who is going to return, uh, given the fact that everyone will have to wear masks and continue to social distance. There's the ESPN side of things and the movies that aren't being released into the theaters. And then... There is the holy grail, and that is Disney+. Plus. And it did show uh, the strength that many people were expecting. Was it strong enough? Um, I, th- I think that the positive news from Disney+, Plus was a lot better than people had expected. You know, the subscriber numbers are inching um, towards the level they hadn't expected for two or three years. Um, but... You know, ultimately, this is the only bright spot um, when you look at what their other businesses are, and they are all things that have been severely hit by the virus. Uh, you know, the parks, and inevitably, as you said, people can't go to them. The media networks or advertising revenues have fallen off a cliff. Um, and studio entertainment, you know, people can't go to the cinema either. So those three pieces are looking very, very weak. And the, uh, and the, the, uh, right. 
Disney Plus piece is, is remarkably strong. Alex, this, this is a concept. It's a Paul Sweeney question, but I, I can throw it at you as well. You know, I think of it in London, the Curzon. There's this old movie theater uh, in London, folks. It's such a throwback to the glory ages of cinema. Come on, Alex. It's done. With this pandemic and with the Universal Trolls uproar and all that, are theaters done? I think actually that when people are allowed out and it's and there is a sort of all clear, um, the desire to get out and go to places that places they've not been able to um, visit, I think there'll be quite a strong rebound actually. As long you know, it maybe it might not be for another year, but I, I think that when it happens, people can get out of the house. They are going to go at pace, and they, that speaks to pubs as much as it does to to cinemas and sports events. But I, I think there is a, a lot of latent appetite for it. Alex, there's an argument uh, that I actually buy into that this pandemic is being blamed for a lot of things, and certainly it has caused a lot, a lot of pain. It's also accelerated accelerated trends that were already in effect, and we already saw the shift to streaming, but I'm wondering how much you expect it to accelerate that shift within Disney and elsewhere. In other words, uh, how much more of its resources is going to pile into the Disney Plus offering even than before, and where will that money come from? I think it is true that there is going to be an acceleration of adoption. The difficulty is, of course, that um, for um, something like Disney+, Plus, you've got to be able to make the content. At the moment, you can't go and film film anything, frankly. Um, now, Disney perhaps has an advantage as a huge back catalog. What will be particularly interesting will be to see how it, it kind of weaponizes all of the content it has in collaboration with each other. You know, at the moment, Disney+, Plus is fundamentally kids' shows, um, the kids' films, uh, Pixar and Marvel and yeah. Pixar, Marvel and Star Wars of course now there is of course Hulu which they control and are going to own very shortly which has a lot more adult oriented content and um, I say that the wrong way but it gears towards an adult um, audience um, and they if they can do bundles which tie right. together Hulu Disney Plus and perhaps the ESPN yeah. then that stuff becomes very appealing Alex Webb, thank you so much for the update, the concept that we see of all this entertainment product. He writes for Bloomberg Opinion. Lisa, I don't get it. I'm not qualified to talk on this stuff. I just canceled a service yesterday that no one in the house uses, and I got another one right behind it that no one in this house uses. I, I just don't get it. Well, there is a question of how many streaming services can each household depend on. However, Disney yeah. Plus has a pretty, uh, a pretty full offering, and, and anyone with kids probably will find yeah. it yeah, I'll, will I'll find it useful. That. I mean, I, come I, on. Uh, but but I do I do wonder. You know, there hasn't been proof that this model can be highly profitable well over the long said. term. And where do you get the money? Is it from the? Is it from you? <laughs> has 15 different streaming services or is it from advertisers with some sort of model uh, that perhaps will come back? Yeah, I think which, that this is going to be a key issue. And when the uproar at NBC with all the management changes, Mr. Lazar is picking up Peacock as well. And I, do you have Peacock, Lisa? Do you, do you, have, you subscribe to I, Peacock? I, I do not. Subscribe I do not Peacock. have Peacock either. Well, how about your Paul Sweeney does? He has them all. <laughs> he has 45 streaming services uh, on his screen right now. Let me get up here, folks. This is one of the great things with the Bloomberg Terminal. This iPhone app for the Terminal is outstanding. Futures up 15. Dow Futures up 122. The VIX 32.32. Stay with us. Another hour of Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning. Not completing. Somebody has a stroke every five minutes in the UK. With time, though, courage, and the right support, lives can be rebuilt. Mine was. But with this current crisis, I can't imagine how much harder it must be for the stroke survivor and their family, more isolated and alone than ever. The Stroke Association is working tirelessly to support the NHS and develop new ways to rebuild lives. To find out more or to donate, search Stroke Association now. The trampoline that makes Dad feel like a kid again. The projector that turns film night into outdoor cinema night. The hot tub that transforms your garden into a spa retreat. With a choice of ways to pay, you can make the most of family time. You can say yes when it matters most at very.co.uk. Goods and services provided by Shop Direct Home Shopping Limited. Credit provided. Subject to status by Shop Direct Finance Company Limited. 18 plus. 
We're all having to get used to the new normal. And at Birkbeck University, we're experts at being adaptable. As London's Evening University, we've been flexing around the lives of busy commuters for nearly 200 years. And you can find everything you need to secure your place for autumn online. From expert advice to virtual tours, a live chat with our students and course applications. Make the new normal, studying for the career that you really want. Search Birkbeck, and it's new problem solved. Typical Danny. Last night, I was chilling with my girls, but ended up spilling my Chardonnay all over my fave lilac nighty when I saw the photo I was tagged in. State of my fake tan. <sighs> but no worries. Just one wash, and my clothes will smell perf with surf. Surf gives you long-lasting fragrance with natural essential oils. Find your fragrance in Surf's laundry range. While most of us are looking out for each other at this time, sadly, fraudsters are trying to take advantage of the situation. Here's Chris Ainsley from Santander with advice for keeping your money safe. Please be vigilant for suspicious calls that appear to be from your bank, the police or the government. Remember, neither Santander, the police or any other organisation will ask you to move or withdraw money for security reasons. For more advice on keeping your money safe, visit santander.co.uk. Max is dreaming of riding a giant chameleon whilst fighting a clan of ninjas. But in reality, he's helping fight COVID-19 in his sleep. Like thousands of others, he's joined the Dream Team. By using the Dream Lab app, they're helping scientists speed up the search for potential treatments. I'll fight you. You go, Max. Search Vodafone Dream Lab and join the Dream Team tonight. Dream Lab app is owned by Vodafone Foundation, an independent charity. Registration number 1089625. Full terms at vodafone.co.uk slash dreamlab. This is another ad for QuickFit. If you're still using your car for essential journeys, this one's for you. QuickFit want you to know that their centres around the country are still open, but only to carry out essential work and maintenance. They're taking extra measures to keep their staff and customers safe. So you can be safe when you're out on the roads. For more information or to find your local centre, visit quickfit.com. QuickFit. Still there when you need them. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can hear every matchup of the 2019-2020 season so far. And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. The losers in a trade war. You benefit if you're just further away from China. So that you can too. What are the ramifications if she crumbles or doesn't crumble? Bloomberg Radio, the Bloomberg Business, Radio.com, and iHeart Radio apps, and BloombergRadio.com. Bloomberg, the world is listening. From the financial capital of the world, 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Economics. The data looks awful, and it's going to get worse for a while. The shock, we could not have anticipated. We could have done a better response. Finance. Central banks are being asked to effectively finance fiscal deficits. Investment. Bond markets are caught between a fiscal rock and a QE hard place. We're in a great depression. It's bad, and it's only getting worse from here. Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance, Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen. We welcome you on a Wednesday. Equity markets, yeah, they're up again. Not like they've been up the last two days, but nevertheless, up, up, up for equities. Much to talk about and really focus on the first of three economic reports. ADP was grim and right on survey. 20 million, that's an unimaginable uh, number. Claims tomorrow, the jobs report on Friday. Uh, let's get right to it. Bloomberg Surveillance this morning brought to you by Cohn Resnick. Advisory assurance tax, Cone Resnick, can help your business mitigate disruption and mobilize for the future. Visit their Coronavirus Resource Center today, ConeResnick.com slash COVID-19. On Wednesdays, we spell it Cone Resnick, C-O-H-N-R-E-Z-N-I-C-K, ConeResnick.com slash COVID-19. Nineteen, Paul. We're going to get to this in a moment with uh, with uh, David Wilson, but I, I just want to front run it a little bit. The auto companies, I, I can't <laughs> fathom what they're going through, looking at demand and just Paul the logistics of getting 
all those parts through the factory. Exactly, Tom. I mean, now you think about it, uh, the auto industry, you read stories about, you know, uh, you know, auto ships out at sea loaded with cars from uh, Japan and, and Europe just kind of sitting out there waiting to be unloaded because, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the, the lots are absolutely full, you know. Um, so uh, this is one of the issues. I mean, even though GM had some uh, really good pickup sales in the quarter, yeah. uh, it's going to be uh, just a, a huge issue going forward. And you think about the supply chain and parts and all that. So, uh, like many industries, they're trying to kind of adapt here to what has been, a, you know, a, just a real fall off in demand. Their chief financial officer speaking with Bloomberg. We'll look for that in a couple hours uh, as well. Right now with the equity report, and I know he leads with Generous Motors. Here's David Wilson. Indeed, Tom. And, uh, Paul, you mentioned the pickup trucks. Sales of those vehicles climbed 27% in the first quarter. And that was a big reason why profit and revenue for the period beat analyst average estimates in the Bloomberg survey. GM said it plans to restart U.S. and Canadian operations on May 18th. And people familiar with the matter said GM is in talks with banks for a $2 billion loan. You put that all together, General Motors up 7.5% in early trading. Uh, Allergan's up a bit more than 1%. U.S. regulators cleared a $63 billion takeover of the Botox maker by AbbVie. The decision removed the last regulatory hurdle for the deal. AbbVie shares up 1.5%. CVS Health higher by 3%. First quarter results at the drugstore owner, pharmacy benefit manager, and health insurer topped estimates. CVS Health reaffirmed full-year forecast. Been watching Walt Disney. Shares a little changed at this point. They were lower earlier on. Uh, fiscal second quarter earnings trailed estimates by the most in more than a decade. Uh, Disney had to shut down theme parks, stock cruise ships, and delay new movies because of the coronavirus. The company's skipping a dividend payment due in July. Uh, on the other hand, you have growth in the streaming services of Disney, especially Disney+. Plus. Uh, beyond that... Uh, you're looking at Activision Blizzard up 7%. The video game maker raised this year's earnings and sales forecast after first quarter results, top down analyst estimates. Electronic Arts, though, down 3.5%. Uh, competitor of Activision uh, earnings forecast for the current fiscal year was just below the average estimate. Uh, you got United Airlines down one percent. The carrier is raising two and a quarter billion dollars by selling bonds privately. Norwegian Cruise Line, on the other hand, up three and a half percent after raising a total of two point two three billion. Uh, selling stocks and bonds 14% more than planned and doing yeah. a $400 million yeah. deal with a private equity firm, yeah. L. Catterton. You, you, you Insurance. See. You got Prudential down 2%. First quarter operating income was lower than estimates. Its market swings hurt results. Uh, revenue also missed projections. And all states down 1%. First quarter revenue at that insurer missed estimates by the most in more than a decade. Yeah. Net interest income dropped 35%. Uh, you got Snap down 3%. The owner of the social media site Snapchat was cut to sell from neutral Killing City Group. Pinterest down 16.5%. The online traffic service said revenue He's fell last month because of coronavirus outbreak. I don't hurt advertisers. Uh, and I got one more for you. Oh, I'm sure. me. Yes, finally. Yes. <laughs> yes. You were waiting for it, I know. Yep. Shares are up 9%. The maker of plant-based meat substitutes had an unexpected first quarter profit. Revenue beat projections, even though restaurant closings hurt demand. So, so this is serious now. I mean, this is, there's no jokes about this. There's, first of all, the serious medical issues of these good people working at these factories. And then, am I right, David and Paul, that Beyond Meat has a huge substitution opportunity here? Well, it's certainly there because it's getting harder to buy meat in supermarkets. I mean, you got Wendy's uh, unable to supply fresh uh, beef to a lot of their restaurants, and so they're having to take items off the menu. You put that all together, I mean, there's yeah. certainly an opportunity. It's just a question of whether yeah. people are willing to go with the plant-based versions, the faux meat, if you will, as opposed to oh, the, uh, faux meat. the real the faux meat. <laughs> okay. You know, Paul, this used to be like a big, big company business. Anaconda Copper, Eastman Kodak, right. Westinghouse. Now the Bloomberg headline is Disney, <laughs> fine. General <laughs> yep. Motors, fine. Beyond Meat and Peloton. 
<laughs> two Beyond future, me killing it. Two future Dow components. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, this the new world we're living in, Tom. So, yeah. you know, one of the things, Tom, is we think about, you know, the conversation goes to reopening the economy. Uh, it's a question of, you know, what are some of the treatments out there for this virus? Is there a vaccine even out there for uh, this virus? And so the focus is really on the big pharma companies out there. Uh, Gilead is one of them. Valerie Bauman is a senior health care reporter for Bloomberg Law. And Valerie, thanks so much for joining us. As we talk about Gilead, it's got this drug out there called remdesivir. Tell us where that is. How important is that into the treatment? And is that going to be an, uh, a real, a big play for the treatment of this virus? Hi. Um, well, the- Gilead just received FDA authorization on May 1st for emergency use of uh, remdesivir. And so it's the first medication backed by early clinical data to be made available to fight coronavirus. Um, You know, it's been showing really positive results in shortening hospital stays uh, here in the U.S., even though early studies in China didn't show um, any difference in patients. Um, the, the, The really interesting thing to me is that um, this is setting the company up for major profits if the drug is successful. However, the company could be forced to license its patents if the drug is approved, if the drug uh, can't keep up with uh, production demand, from what I'm hearing. What is the drug going to cost? Well, the company is mum on this. I wasn't able to get them to call me back, but analysts at Piper <laughs> Sandler say the company could reasonably price the drug at $4,500 for a round of treatment, which typically is 10 days. And they could still generate more than $2 billion in revenue for the biotech company. Who pays that? I mean, th- th- I mean, this is like completely captured the mind of Americans. Is it just understood it's picked up by the insurance companies or the government? Well, at this point, um, insurance companies, yes, would be paying the bill. There's also going to be likely subsidies at the federal level to help pay for this. It's unclear uh, how many patients might get stuck paying out of pocket, particularly, you know, as we know, millions and millions of uh, Americans are out of work right now and losing their health insurance. So, Valerie, I mean, one of the issues here is, you know, if there is a treatment, a really proven treatment, will the pressure not be on this company, Gilead, to... Again, either put it out there at cost or put it out there, you know, such that everyone has access to it. Won't there be that pressure either from the government or just from the American public? Absolutely. Um, You know, the company is going to have to walk a fine line between pleasing shareholders and um, satisfying, you know, what the public and the government wants. The The worst public relations um, move that they could make right now is pricing the drug too high. Again, no real clear indication of what the price is, but it's important to note that the government does have two methods of recourse if they think that the drug is priced too high. One would be margin rights, which is a provision of the Bay Dole Act of 1980, and if the government does has helped fund any portion of the patent-protected intellectual property related to this drug, um, the government has some authority to seize patents for inventions created with government funding and could theoretically march in and go um, license that. And then there's also something similar called compulsory licensing in which the government wouldn't even need to own part of the intellectual property rights very similar to eminent domain, where they could step in during a pandemic mandate how it's produced, distributed, or even priced, and and also, again, require it to be licensed to another company to ramp up uh, production to meet demand. Valerie, this has been very beneficial. Valerie Bauman with a senior health care reporter, Bloomberg uh, Law, because there would be a lot more on this drug pricing and the pandemic coming up. Right now with our news in New York City, here's Michael Barr. Tom, Paul, thank you very much. The Trump administration plans to disband the White House Coronavirus Task Force, possibly by the end of the month. The decision comes as the daily number of U.S. deaths from the virus rises as President Trump pushes to reopen the economy. New projections show American deaths could skyrocket by the end of the summer as the country reopens. President Trump spoke about it on ABC. These models have been so wrong from day one both on the low side and the upside. They've been so wrong. They've been so out of whack. And they keep making new models, new models, and they're wrong. 
The novel coronavirus already is known to have infected about 1.2 million people in the U.S., including more than 71,000 deaths. A senior government scientist alleges the Trump administration failed to prepare for the onslaught of the coronavirus, then sought a fix by rushing an unproven drug to patients. Dr. Rick Bright, former director of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, filed a whistleblower complaint. His lawyer, Deborah Katz, alleges he was removed from his job and reassigned because he resisted efforts to promote the use of hydroxychloroquine. She says he wants his old job back. He has heard from dozens and dozens of BARDA employees and, uh, and other people within HHS who are desperate to get him back in this role. He's got broad-based support to return to his role because he is the guy who you look to to help the nation combat this, this deadly pandemic. The European Union is predicting a recession of historic proportions this year due to the impact of the coronavirus. Today, it released its first official forecast of the damage COVID-19 has inflicted on the bloc's economy. Global News 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Tech by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom Paul. Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney, we've been dying to talk to you all day about Disney. Let's do it here quickly. You know, we talked to Alex Webb about content yep. as king and all that. Come on, Iger's king. What's he do? I mean, does he like, does he have like a corner office, you know, is he like having lunch with the, the new CEO? I mean, what, what's Iger do in this mess? I really don't know, Tom. I mean, you know, he, he, you know, it's been a very, very sloppy transition here. Uh, you know, after losing his heir apparent, uh, he, he finally says, okay, I'm done. But he says, I'm done right before the biggest well, pandemic. Well, yeah, his defense, who saw the, the pandemic coming. Exactly. You know. And then he's, and then, but now he's back, I think, to some degree. So if I'm the CEO of Bob Chapek, I'm not really sure what my role is here. So it's a little bit of uncertainty there, and that's not good. Yeah, it's, it's an absolute sport. Is is well, Paul? Yeah, it's interesting here, Tom. So we'll have to see. But Disney, you know, they got the assets, and uh, they had some of the best assets going into the pandemic. They have the best assets coming out, so they'll be fine here. So just looking at futures here, Tom, we still a little bit uh, of green on the screen. S&P up 18. Dow Industrials up 145, let's call it, on the Dow. That puts it at 23,908. We'll stick it right there. This is Bloomberg. Business is constantly evolving. Is your financial printer evolving to keep ahead of the curve? At Command Financial, we are redefining financial printing by providing industry-leading expertise, leveraging technology, and honing processes and best practices. Every day, Command helps SEC registrants, as well as members of their working groups, including securities attorneys and investment bankers, prepare, file, and disseminate regulatory and disclosure documents, such as registration statements, MA documents, and mutual fund prospectuses and reports. Command provides a full range of services to help you effectively complete your deal, meet your disclosure requirements, and achieve your shareholder communications objectives. Visit our website at commandfinancial.com and learn how we're evolving, not only with the times, but also with your business requirements. Command Financial, redefining financial printing. Elite advisory firms rely on BNY Mellon's Pershing to meet the needs of their most complex clients. Karen Novak, Chief Operating Officer at Pershing Advisor Solutions, explains how. At BNY Mellon's Pershing, we bring customized insights and strategies to help you grow your advisory business and stay on the leading edge. We can support the needs of your most sophisticated clients with a full range of investment and wealth management solutions from access to private banking to consolidated bank and brokerage custody. Learn why so many of the largest advisory firms turn to us for the financial strength and high-touch service that BNY Mellon's Pershing can provide. Are you well positioned to stand out from your competition? Learn more at Pershing.com or call 800-445-4467. Brokerage custody provided by Pershing LLC and other services provided by Pershing Advisor Solutions LLC. Both members of FINRA and SIPC. Private banking and bank custody provided by BNY Mellon NA. Member FDIC. Influential conversations from Bloomberg Top. This is a message from the government about the emergency measures to support the economy during the period of disruption caused by the coronavirus. To help you, your business, and your workers affected, you can apply for cash grants, business rate holidays, statutory sick pay relief packages, 
as well as the Coronavirus Job Retention and Self-Employment Income Support Schemes. For information, go to gov.uk forward slash business dash support now. When next in Asda, why not try a new mobile scan and go app? Simply download the app, scan your shop with your mobile and pack as you go. Then head to the self-checkout to pay. Quick, easy and contact free. So you have more time to get your cook on. Asda. Mobile data charges may apply. Suitable for iOS 9 and Android 5 or above. Selected stores subject to availability. While most of us are looking out for each other at this time, sadly, fraudsters are trying to take advantage of the situation. Here's Chris Ainsley from Santander with advice for keeping your money safe. Please be wary of people you've met online who claim to be stranded abroad and urgently need money. Always take time to think before you act, and if you think you're the victim of fraud, then let your bank note right away. For more advice on keeping your money safe, visit santander.co.uk. News 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow. U.S. companies cut more than 20 million jobs in April. That's according to today's ADP report, showing a record slump in employment. And with an economic picture like that, J.P. Morgan cross asset strategist Don Norman says equities are overpriced. This is going to be an extremely abnormal recovery, meaning it's going to take years to recoup the lost output and the lost jobs. And that usually equates to uh, a multi-year process of recouping the lost profits. Right now, S&P futures are up 17 points. Dow futures up 135. NASDAQ futures up 62. The DAX in Germany is down to tenths percent. Ten-year Treasury down 17, 30 seconds. Yield 0.71 percent. Yield on the two-year 0.18 percent. NYMEX crude oil is down 4.9 percent on $1.20 at 2336 a barrel. COMEX gold down 1 percent or $17.10 at $16.93.30 an ounce. The euro 1.0811 against the dollar. The yen 106.17. And Uber technology is saying it'll eliminate 3,700 jobs and permanently close 180 driver service centers. The first in a series of cost-cutting measures to be announced in the next two weeks as a response to the coronavirus pandemic. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Karen, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keene. It was eight years, eight years after Charles Dickens born that Florence Nightingale was born to a very, very rich family in early Victorian uh, times, and she changed nursing. Of course, all of this devolved to St. Thomas's Hospital in London, and that is the hospital that saved uh, the life of the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom here just weeks ago. It's National Nurses Week, and that is a big deal uh, across this nation this year. We talked to Lauren Sauer of the Johns Hopkins University. Everyone is working incredibly hard to um, keep up with the patient load, keep up with the demands of using the PPE, keep up with the demands of uh, working overtime to make sure units get tur- turned into COVID units um, and uh, patients are safely cared for. Um, we're, we're incredibly grateful for the work of our nurses. It's really just been unbelievable. Lauren Sauer, what I notice about emergency medicine is you try to learn every step of the way. What do you know now about the therapeutics of this virus versus where you were six weeks ago? Well, we just conducted the first phase of um, the ACT trial, um, which is the NIH adaptive trial, and the first arm was remdesivir. So we are starting to see some positive data, which is really exciting. Um, we're, we're learning a lot about some of the other drugs that have been tried, hydroxychloroquine, chloroquine. Um, we're learning a lot about proning of patients. Uh, so there's a lot of studies underway um, all throughout the hospital. Lauren Sauer, talk to me a little bit about how first responders are, are feeling about, you know, the, the president and the administration saying that they want to reopen uh, the economy, even if it means more, you know, rise in deaths and infections. How many percentage of the population we think have had COVID? Uh, you know, do we need much more testing to try and understand where the virus is and in what phase we are exactly? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think the, the first word that comes to mind is scared. Um, when you're in the hospital every day and you're seeing these patients come in quite sick and knowing that there's so many of the pop, so many of the population who are not infected um, yet and who may be as state, as states and locations start to reopen, uh, we get really nervous. Um, we're finally starting to see a bit of an easing in the number of cases. 
uh, in Maryland, and we um, we approach that easing with cautious optimism because, uh, you know, as you know, as you start to reopen, you'll see a spike in cases, and in, and in several of the states that are already starting to ease restrictions, their cases are still on rapid increase. So, um, you know, in states like Florida, Nebraska, other places where they're starting to ease the restrictions, they're their, their case counts are actually on the rise. So I think we are all in the healthcare setting nervous that uh, these restrictions will be eased too quickly and we'll see a massive spike in, in the number of cases. Do we have more drugs now? And how close are we to a vaccine to try and fight this COVID-19? I think we're still a ways away from a vaccine. I mean, everyone is, at, is working overtime on on the development of a vaccine. Um, and in fact, there was a, a summit uh, late last, or sorry, earlier last week, specifically on focused on uh, racing to get a vaccine up and up and running. It's a, a true a tour de force of global efforts to develop a, a coronavirus vaccine. On the on the therapeutic side, we have remdesivir. We saw the positive data come out from the first phase of that clinical trial and several other clinical trials around remdesivir. Um, so it is it is definitely looking promising. The data are looking promising, but, you know, that is an IV infusion drug, so people have to be given it in the hospital. So I think there's a lot of people working on drugs that can be given orally, drugs that can be given administered at yeah. home or in the outpatient setting. Um, so we have a long ways to go. Lauren Sauer, expert in emergency room medicine at the Johns Hopkins University and, of course, part of the Bloomberg School of Public Health. And we thank Michael Bloomberg for his uh, support of this uh, company, the terminal company, Bloomberg LP, and also this radio television station in his philanthropy to his Johns Hopkins uh, University. Paul, really extraordinary to talk to Lauren. She's got yeah. such a mix of academics and the real visceral feel of being like there. Being like there actually, in like your, yes, this isn't oh, this isn't George Clooney before he had gray hair. <laughs> exactly, you know, it's, no. not, it's not ER. No, Lauren Sauer is you know in the uh, yeah. in the front lines with so many other uh, uh, brave healthcare workers, and you know she <clears throat> kind of highlights that issue that I think people are really grappling with right now. Governors and and the federal government as well is how do you reopen this economy? And you know, yeah. uh, and that's kind of the central issue here. And I think you know you've got on the one hand uh, Governor Andrew Cuomo of New York really taking a very methodical metrics driven. Uh, I think path to reopening the economy, uh, and then you have some other states who perhaps are just a little bit more aggressive, I guess you could say, uh, in terms of opening their economy. And, and as Lauren was mentioning here, the concern from healthcare workers is that if you do it too quickly, um, then you run the yeah. risk of just you know more cases and more uh, pain and, and things like that. And you have to weigh that, of course, uh, against the economic uh, impact as well. So very difficult decision for government leaders. And it's and then, Paul, it's every nation for themselves. And clearly, in the case of America, we've got a huge bias to states' rights, and every state will will take their own approach. And of course, for those of you nationwide listening, and we thank you for listening, particularly those of you on our digital product uh, as you work from home. Paul, what's so remarkable from you to me right now, I can literally, I'm waving at Paul. Hi, Paul. <laughs> Your backyard's as big as Central Park. I see it. Uh, and, and Paul, the, the thing that's so important is how New York City is diminishing in its intensity of this pandemic, while New Jersey and Pennsylvania, uh, it, it really on a, a vector basis, it's, in, it's increasing in intensity. Yeah, New Jersey's become kind of kind of the new ground zero after New York City here. So we're trying to to bend the curve, uh, and we're we're you know kind of usually <clears throat> typically a week or yeah. two weeks behind New York, and that and those some of the metrics. Yeah. We will continue. Futures up 19. Dow futures up 158. Of course, that tough ADP report uh, tomorrow, 23 hours from now. Claims. Stay with us worldwide. This is Bloomberg. Have you wanted to speak a new language, but you thought it'd be too hard or take too much time? Then go to Babbel.com, download the app, and try it for free. In just 15 minutes a day, you'll be on your way to speaking a new language in just a few weeks. And right now, you can try Babbel for free. Babbel starts out teaching you words and phrases by matching them with pictures. You won't believe how easy the interactive program is. 
Soon the sentences get a little bigger, and before you know it, you're having simulated conversations voiced by native speakers. And because Babbel is crafted by language experts and uses the spaced repetition method, in just 10 to 15 minutes a day, you'll be speaking the language of your choice with real confidence. With Babbel, you can speak a language. Just go to babbel.com and start your first lesson in the language of your choice for free. Download the Babbel app or go to babbel.com and try it for free. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com. Hey, y'all. Jeff Foxworthy here. Now, if you've ever found yourself repeating the same thing over and over for 75 years, you might be Smokey Bear. Only you can prevent wildfires. That's why I'm filling in for Smokey to switch things up, because there's a lot more to say. And I should know, because my grandfather was a firefighter, and one of the things he taught me is that the people that love the outdoors the most are often the ones accidentally starting wildfires, which means... Always BYOB. <laughs> no, bring your own bucket to the campfire. And be extra careful with things like burning yard trimmings. Don't just walk away, or chances are you might be starting a wildfire. So, for the love of the outdoors, go to smokybear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Brought to you by the U.S. Forest Service, your state forester, and the Ad Council. This is a Bloomberg Money Minute. Empl- get your cook on with Asta. With butcher selection, quarter pounder beef burgers. Get a four pack for just two pounds twenty eight. And salmon fillets. Get a two pack for only two pounds ninety seven. So dinner's always a winner at Asta. We're committed to low prices every day on the quality products you need. Asta. Selected stores and lines subject to availability. TSB believe in people helping people. So if, for whatever reason, you become an innocent victim of fraud, they will refund every penny you lost from your TSB account. Find out more about their fraud refund guarantee at tsb.co.uk. Terms and conditions apply. Typical Danny. Last night I was chilling with my girls, but ended up spilling my Chardonnay all over my fave Lilac Nighty when I saw the photo I was tagged in. State of my fake tan. <sighs> but no worries. Just one wash and my clothes will smell perf with Surf. Surf gives you long-lasting fragrance with natural essential oils. Find your fragrance in Surf's laundry range. This is an important message from the government. For now, we must all still stay at home. It can be hard, but it's making a difference. So please keep going for the ones you love. Keep going for every key worker on the front line as they keep going for us. Keep going because together we will beat the virus. To all of you making sacrifices every day, thank you. Stay home, protect the NHS, save lives. Broadcasting live from the Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio in New York. Bloomberg 1130. To Washington, D.C. Bloomberg 991. To Boston. Bloomberg 1061. To San Francisco. Bloomberg 960. To the country. Sirius XM Channel 119. And around the globe. The Bloomberg Business App and BloombergRadio.com. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Good morning, I'm Karen Moscow, along with Tom Keen and Paul Sweeney. And right now at the open, the S&P 500 is moving higher, up 7 tenths percent of 18 points at 28.87. The Dow Jones Industrial Average up 7 tenths percent or 162 points at 24,045. And the Nasdaq is up 8 tenths percent or 70 points at 88.79. Ten-year Treasury down 18.30 seconds, yield 0.72 percent, yield on the two-year 0.18 percent. NYMEX crude oil down 3.5 percent or 87 cents at 23. 68 a barrel. Comex gold is down 9 tenths percent or $15.80 at 16.94.80 an ounce. The euro 1.0818 against the dollar. The yen is at 106.14. Tom and Paul. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Karen. Really watching the euro, folks. It had a brutal morning. No other way to put it versus stronger yen and even click against stronger Swiss franc. And, you know, I know we're focused on the American labor economy, but I'll tell you, folks, uh, keep your on the euro, even if you're not an FX aficionado. Paul Sweeney and Tom Keen with us now. Kirk Hartman with Wells Fargo considering the mix of assets and considering what to do 
with this stock market. Kirk, we've done a little bit of equity today, but let me let me go to that now if I could and give you the dumb question. Why are stocks going up? Well, I think the market is pricing in normalized earnings. Um, to your point, at uh, you know 2,800 S and P and S and P earnings uh, expected to fall from the 150, 160 area to uh, 100. Um, you've got a 28 PE, which is a pretty rich market. Um, but again, I think the market is looking at the normalized uh, earnings for the next 12 months, maybe starting in June, and um, it's pricing that in. So, Kirk, I mean, it, it, this market, I think a lot of folks have been sensing that it's really just simply supported by the Fed here, how aggressive the Fed has stepped in here to inject liquidity uh, in the market. Is that your call as well? And, and, and does that give you a certain level of concern that this really isn't kind of the natural level for this market? Well, the Fed uh, drew a line in the sand, in my mind, on April 8th when it put in um, its secondary market uh, purchase program. So the Fed said we're going to support those credits and companies that are necessary for survival. I think what you're seeing is a tale of two markets, meaning the S&P and the large caps uh, are doing very well. And then you've got, uh, you know, if the S&P is only down 10, you've got the mid caps and the small caps, which are down 22. <clears throat> so um, I think you've got a really bifurcated market. What's the advice of Wells Fargo? I mean, every company has a character. You have a heritage of economics and investment strategy that's just extraordinary. And I would suggest, Kirk, it's very visceral with America. So you go out to a meeting of your, your financial professionals. I'm going to pick a city, Kansas City. What's the Kirk Hartman message to the people in that room scared stiff? Well, I think you've got to look through this market and own those companies that are going to survive. Survival is winning. So um, I think you need to say, okay, in the near term, if I can't uh, tolerate volatility, I want to stay in the safe uh, names. Longer term, um, and especially for uh, long-term endowments or uh, long-term plans, there are obviously some great buys here. But, you know, look, you're not going to buy emerging markets right now uh, for the near term. You're not going to buy Europe for the near term, and you're not going to buy uh, small caps for well, the near term. So would you, would you on care? Your horizon. I mean, Paul's taking notes. I'm not. But would you care to give <laughs> us some great ideas today? <laughs> Well, I think there are a lot of opportunities here. Um, obviously, pl again, play the quality names. You want to play the cloud. You want to play infrastructure. Uh, interestingly, you want to pay the online payments business. I think you want to pay the medical device companies. There are a lot of postponed surgeries that are going to come back now. Um, I think the airlines and oils, you've got to be patient and probably avoid that near term. The other thing I think is a huge opportunity investment <clears throat> great corporates. Um, you know, the Fed drew a line in the sand and supported the market, but you can, uh, you know, get yields between 5 and 9%. Well, you had Delta, Boeing, and Ford come to market. I mean, this so is great, Paul. Paul, do you think that Kirk, God, that Warren Buffett read Kirk's memos on the airlines? you got to be patient. <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> So, Kirk, I mean, when we, when we think about some of the opportunities in the credit markets, how can, I mean, where are we in terms of credit quality here? How bad is it going to get, and how much risk are you willing to take when you, when you look at you know, certain fixed income opportunities? Well, you know, high yield spreads have not, uh, notwithstanding all the Fed support, have not really budged, and they're still at distressed levels. I think loan losses in, in areas like energy can be huge, and you've seen name brands, you know, the J. Cruz and the Neiman Marcus and, the, you know, all the names that we're familiar with that are, uh, you know, in chapter or contemplating a chapter. So you've got to avoid that. But I think in the crossover credits, the double B, triple B, some great opportunities here. I mean, spreads are very wide. And uh, the Fed's put a line and almost a floor in the sand, so take advantage of it. It's interesting, Kirk. We're gonna. It's you know one of the things we're you know investors are kind of dealing with right now is uh, you know kind of how the markets have kind of come back. You know, if you just look at the S and P, it's kind of retraced maybe half of its thirty four percent decline, peak to trough here. Yet the economic data is so brutal. We're going to get some more uh, jobs data later this week. Uh, the GDP data we know is, is ugly. Earnings have been ugly. Uh, we saw Disney last night, which just was some brutal numbers. I mean, what's the, what's the risk here that this just is lower for longer in terms of the economic impact here, whether it's a second wave of the virus? Or do you, do you just have to power through and look out at 2021, 2022? 
well, you called it. I think it's the second wave, and I think the worry is um, how does this virus play out? Is there the second wave of the virus, which I think would uh, have the market um, correct a bit again? I am not in the camp that we're ever going to test these lows again. I think the, there's so much money and stimulus in the system. So could we yeah. dip uh, maybe down 5 or 10%? Yeah, we could again. <clears throat> Um, but I don't think we're going back to those lows. Yeah. I think that uh, that was the bottom. Kirk, I asked this earlier today, and it deserves a re- re-ask to you. What's the new actuarial assumption? I mean, you're going to sit in a room with people, retail, institutional at Wells Fargo, and you're going to tell them they have to save more for retirement. I get that. But how much more? Are you going to reset to a lower actuarial Assumption, which means we have to put ever, 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 ever more aside for retirement? Well, I think you have to save more. And the thing that I worry about was all the debt in the market. Um, all you're doing when you borrow this much money is you're borrowing from your future. So I think that um, what we have to measure is how much the long-term effect uh, is going to be of all the debt on economic growth, which in my mind is going to be slower than it would have been. So um, I think individuals and companies for, you know, endowments and plans to budget a 7% actuarial return, um, I think that's going to be tough. So, Kirk, it's interesting here. I think what a lot of investors are trying to figure out here is, you know, this pandemic is arguably, obviously, once in a lifetime, maybe once in a hundred year type of situation, you know, much like uh, the Great Depression of the 30s. How will it impact consumers? Are you thinking big picture, 30,000 foot, 100,000 foot about how consumer behavior may change? And therefore, I want to be overweight or underweight are people ever going to fly again therefore i want to short airlines but they're never going to go on a cruise again therefore i'm just not going to play the cruise industry are you making any big thirty thousand foot kind of views i think it's a function of the vaccine and hopefully we will get the vaccine so i think near term uh, to your point uh expect a lot of volatility and uncertainty but uh, I'm in the camp of a year or two down the road, which is a ways away. I think things will be coming back to normal. So, look, this is my sixth economic crisis, and um, <laughs> we're all different. <laughs> wait, wait, you know, is this... I go way back, and uh, you know we'll get through this. It's, Kurt, it's just you've got to you've got to power through it. Is this your sixth once in a lifetime crisis? That's right. 87, 94, 99, 2000, oh. 2001, 2008, 2020. Re- so uh, re- remember, seventy four, seventy five. This will never happen again. <laughs> well, I remember 87, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, okay, well, I'm showing my age. Go away. Kirk Hartman with us with Wells Fargo. Really great perspective there. Really, really appreciate uh, that. So many of the cho- We don't mean to make light of it, folks. So many uh, choices to make here. Let's do this. Let's do the news with the news from New York City. Here's Michael Barr. Questions surrounding the origins of COVID-19 have sparked a war of words between Washington and Beijing. President Trump and Secretary of State Pompeo have doubled down on the assertion that the virus originated from a lab in the Chinese city of Wuhan. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, says it's unclear where the virus originated. Did it come out of the virology lab in Wuhan? Did it occur in the uh, in the wet uh, market there in Wuhan? Did it occur somewhere else? Uh, and the answer to that is we don't know. Uh, and as mentioned by many people, uh, various agencies, both civilian and U.S. government, are looking at that. China's ambassador to Washington called for an end to the blame game over the coronavirus. In a column published in the Washington Post, he says that allegations blaming China for the outbreak risk decoupling the world's two largest economies. Thousands of workers in meat and poultry plants across the U.S. have been sickened by the coronavirus, leading some industry insiders to predict it will affect the supply chain. Mark Lauritsen with the United Food and Commercial Workers International Union told ABC some of the biggest hot spots in the country are in counties that have meat packing plants. You have these huge buildings with sometimes two and three thousand people working in them. So it literally is like a stationary cruise ship. And when those plants are there, all it takes is for one person to get in there with the with the virus, and it spreads really quick, just like on a cruise ship. Lordson says there needs to be one set of safety rules for all plants. 
Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Quick Take by Bloomberg, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Michael Barr. This is Bloomberg. Tom, Paul? Michael Barr, thanks so much. Paul Sweeney and Tom King. Paul, I want to dive into the interior of Bloomberg Intelligence, which you built. Uh-huh. And it's just as simple as is, is, is China says they can't forecast GDP. Carl Weinberg says he can't forecast economics. And we got endless companies saying they can't forecast a forecast. Are the people at Bloomberg Intelligence still doing forecasts? They are still doing forecasts, absolutely. And, uh, it, you know, it's uh, yeah, you, you can't rely on the companies, Tom. You, you really have to kind of dive into your earnings models and kind of look at the drivers here and t- make your best guess and lay out, you know, the assumptions that you're making uh, so that the reader can kind of look at the assumptions, uh, you know, and, and kind of get a sense of kind of where you're coming from and, and how your model's being built out as you generate your revenue, yeah. and your profits, and your cash flows. Uh, and that's what a good analyst does. And, um, you know, it, the guidance is helpful, uh, but at the end of the day, you need to have right. your own numbers, your own assumptions, and, and really lay, lay them out there for uh, investors. Well, if it's John Butler, you know, doing Apple or whatever, you know, who's ever over, you know, uh, yep. uh, Karen Ubelhart doing industrial, is it harder to game out in crisis unit dynamics or price dynamics, which is harder to guess. You know, I think right now it's 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 probably units because you just don't really have a sense of you know where the end user demand is whether whether it's an iPhone or whether it's yeah. a, you know a tractor uh, for Karen Ubelhart. You know, just what is the demand curve out there, and that's kind of where you you start from. And what makes it even different for investors right now, Tom, is just that you know there, honestly there really is no precedent for this. It's it's not two thousand eight <clears throat> two thousand nine. There's really no precedent here. So yeah, uh, that's you know that. that's where you just have to go you know conservative <clears throat> best guess lay out your assumptions, uh, and let yeah. the reader kind of get a sense of whether they agree or not. Well, we're going to go through some important conversations here at Bloomberg Television, Bloomberg Radio, and all of uh, the effort that we do. So many of our people, particularly in print, working from home, just it's been a, from our technical side. The technical people were over yesterday, you know, Paul. Yeah. They, they came over yesterday. I'm sure I was technically up to speed. But you're just living off your iPhone, so that that that's all you need—the Bloomberg app on your iPhone. That's I all got you my need. Bloomberg app on the iPhone. It's absolutely killer, and I can hit this button and hit this button and this button, this button, boom! I'm over to a data check of the markets. Let's do that right now, folks. Slams in here on the great Wi-Fi we've got. We're up 60 points, not like we were uh, three hours ago, but futures lift, 23,938. The VIX, 32.45 in a solid stick. NASDAQ 100. Up and I haven't even looked at Amazon or Apple or Microsoft or the rest. The five stocks of the NASDAQ 100 make up 120% of the NASDAQ 100. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. I saw you last night. This is a Bloomberg Pursuits look at luxury. Although Wall Street types will miss out on the power mingling, the Robin Hood Foundation's annual gala will be broadcast live on TV. And the best part, instead of having to fork out $3,000 a ticket, anybody can join. Tina Fey will host the gala, Chris Rock and Jimmy Fallon will make a joke or two, and John Bon Jovi, Sting, Billy Joel, and Mariah Carey will all sing. Robin Hood's hour-long Rise Up New York virtual telethon aims to raise $100 million for 200 charities helping the poorest New Yorkers. Tune in 7 p.m. Eastern, Monday, May 11th. Meanwhile, the world's richest are also using this time to make some money. Family offices with cash on hand are piling into private debt to take advantage of cheaper valuations and avoid the volatility of stock markets. Those lending privately often focus on real estate, with property developers turning to family offices for extra flexibility and faster access to cash than with most banks. Visit BloombergPursuits.com for more. I'm Andrew O'Day, Bloomberg Radio. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology, makes innovation happen. NJIT faculty mentored Christoph Camacho when he was a student, helping him co-found a startup and patent a device that uses drone technology for reforestation and to collect valuable data for land management. I founded Paratrees back in 2016, taking what I learned from my research at NJIT and migrating it to uh, a startup. Our technology is to really enhance land management operations, so we work very closely with land management companies 
So we have a drone that performs precision reforestation, and uh, we do storm damage assessment. Having access to drones that can collect data so it's much faster. And what is more important, we help them drive management decisions. NJIT has been there every step of the way, going full force with my company. NJIT, New Jersey Institute of Technology. Learn more at njit.edu. Global News. Blagging your way through the kids' schoolwork. Pretending you always knew the capital of Brunei is Bandar Sera Begawan, when really you're frantically scrolling through the internet with your phone under the table, hoping that they just think you're an absolute fountain of knowledge. Whatever you rely on the internet for, rely on Talk Talk to stay connected. Talk Talk for everyone. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With Game Replay on TuneIn, you can listen to every power play, slap shot, and goal of the 2019-2020 season so far. Suter, Zakata, to Fiala, he scores! And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search Classic Game Replays to start listening. How do you keep track of all your favorite stations and podcasts? Easy. You add them to your favorites list. Just find the audio you want to bookmark and tap the heart icon. Then, whenever you want to browse your favorites, you'll find everything under the favorites tab. Get your MLB fix with these great podcasts on TuneIn. Fill your seventh inning stretch with the Ringer MLB show. It's a, it's a, I just can't get over it. It's like, oh, well, Jeter Downs. Didn't realize he was a top. Like, my dad is drinking the Kool-Aid on this. He's like, oh, of course. you know, Mookie was going to leave. I'm like, what do you mean? You don't know that. Slide into second with the Starting Nine podcast. Nolan Arenado slides right into the top spot wow. for a favorite baseball player active in the league right now. It is a pleasure to be sitting next to you, sir. Thank you, man. I appreciate it. Thank yeah, you. this is, uh, the, we've been waiting a long time for this. We actually, in terms of like Four, active players, the bases with the StatCast podcast. Uh, ways of going about it. You know, I picked third, so it, in some ways it made it easier to me, for me, you know, Mike, uh, just to go over the first couple of picks, you know, Mike took Barry Bonds, who I think was kind of the obvious guy to take number one, not only Catch these and more MLB podcasts right here on TuneIn. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is a Bloomberg Business Flash. And I'm Karen Moscow, and stocks are rising for a third day after President Trump pushed again to reopen the economy, while stocks in Europe struggle for direction as investors weigh mixed corporate earnings against dismal economic data. The dollar is gaining. We check the markets every 15 minutes throughout the trading day on Bloomberg. The S&P 500 up four tenths percent or 12 points to 28.80. Dow Jones Industrial Average up a quarter percent or 62 points at 23,945. And the Nasdaq up one percent or 92 points at 89.01. Ten-year Treasury down 17.30 seconds, yield 0.71 percent. The yield on the two-year 0.18 percent. NYMEX crude oil is down four percent on 99 cents at 23.59 a barrel. COMEX gold is down six tenths percent or $10.60 at 16.99.80 an ounce. The year Euro 1.0818 against the dollar, the yen 106.09. U.S. companies cut more than 20 million jobs in April. That's according to today's ADP report, showing a record slump in employment. There's optimism those positions will be recouped as America gets back to work. But for Citigroup Chief Investment Officer David Balin, a second wave of the coronavirus is all but certain. This whole debate in the market as to whether or not there's a second wave, we are going to see a material increase in the number of coronavirus cases, whether that be in Europe or in the United States. Meanwhile, watching shares of General Motors up more than 5.5% after reporting better than expected quarterly earnings on booming sales of new pickup models. And that's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Tom and Paul. Karen Moscow, thank you so much. We appreciate that. Tom and I, we've been talking a lot this morning about stocks and bonds. We want to switch gears a little bit, talk commodities. When we talk commodities, we like to welcome our good friend Mike McGlone. He runs the commodity stuff for Bloomberg Intelligence. Mike, thanks so much for joining us here. Let's start with oil right here. We had, boy, just incredible volatility in oil. We've had a nice little run up here uh, in WTI north of $20 a barrel. Finally, it's been a long time since we've been there, giving back a little bit today. Let's start with oil here. I mean, the supply-demand dynamics are just brutal for oil here, uh, even after a modest cutback by OPEC. What is your thoughts about crude right here? 
settling in at a lower plateau. I think, you know, volatility in crude oil is the highest ever. As far as futures go back, it's over 100% on the annualized basis. So it should expect some decent moves. And we know that negative price is probably the lowest we're ever going to get. But with bond yields and with Chinese GDP and with the global recession, we should expect it to just settle down and stay low for a long time. So yeah. you look at Brent. Brent really bounced from 20 to 30. Now it's pretty good resistance. It just should settle in and stay down for a long time. Michael, i got to switch gears because you are the stud the way you consulted to the TV show Billions. So here's the script, <laughs> folks. So your multitude of computers can solve abstract math equations resulting in the mining of Bitcoin worth a million right now, but backed by what? Nada. Next. I can't believe Tom went to Bitcoin, Michael. Rhodes. I mean, come on, Michael. You, you're a stud now. You've got Bitcoin on Billions. Is Bitcoin becoming more mainstream when we see it on Billions? Well, Tom, really appreciate you going to Bitcoin. And I think the key thing is is it's got limited supply and it's being adopted. And it doesn't matter what it's backed by, like the U.S. dollar. People are adopting it and believing it. And those signs are clear everywhere. You see in future. What do you mean by adopting? What do you mean by adopting? There's more institutional interest. I'm going to sound like Bobby X. Okay, go. <laughs> I see The indications I see are more institutional interest, not only anecdotally, but actually physically. Futures open interest are the highest ever. Like you look at products like change on exchanges like uh, the GBTC, assets under management are the highest ever, transactions are higher, cash rates higher. But if you look at the other ones, it's really not having, happening. And then you look at, um, that, at supply. As of this next week, the supplies, uh, annual amount of supply that you produce will drop below 2% and continue lower. And that's the big difference with things like gold. If the price of gold goes up, we know mines will bring out more supply. But Bitcoin, it doesn't happen. So all that matters is adoption, and people are adopting it as a digital form of gold. Now, how do you, talk to us about that supply of Bitcoin. I don't really understand that, and, and I'm going to say right here, I probably never will understand the supply of Bitcoin. But give us a sense of just the supply side of this, of this quote-unquote commodity. Simplistically, every day right now we get about 1,800 new Bitcoins on, the, on average a day. As of next week, it'll start going, it'll drop down to 900 new Bitcoins a day. Why? The miners will produce that because of the halving. It's just part of the code, and it's been that way since the beginning. And the bottom line is, let's look at last year. Um, supply was about 4%. It increased around 4%. As of next year, it's going to drop to 2% and continue to drop. And that's the significant difference that I see as a commodity okay, strategy. Okay, great. Who decides that? It was, it's part of the code. Our, our, part of the our, code, Tom. Our, our good friend Satoshi Nakamoto. So there is potential flaws. There has to be a, an issue with the code, but it has worked for 10 years. And when people go back and say, oh, the miners are cost of supply, it doesn't matter now because it's just going away. <laughs> i.e. basically 90% of all Bitcoins that ever should be created have been, and now we're just on the last uh, bunch, so it's becoming a bit of a collectible. Okay, not that I want to be sarcastic, but is this decided on some island off Jamaica? Well, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. that's the significant. It was decided during the last financial crisis, and now that we're in this financial crisis, this is a year that Bitcoin really has to perform, because if it doesn't, that would be a major failure, and it's doing very well. On the year... Compared to the S&P 500, down 10%, yeah, it's yeah, up almost yeah, 30%. Yeah. I know you love that part, time, <laughs> but it's the point. That, so here's the key question for you. Is what's going to stop Bitcoin from doing just what it's been doing for the last 10 years? And that is no, going up. No. The key question is, what does Bobby do on billions? I mean, does he get <laughs> roped into this scam or what? What do you think? Develop well, that's the season the, that's forward. That's part of the key thing, the part the, that people still consider it nascent and a scam makes it somewhat attractive. At some Fair. point, if and when it that becomes point. mainstream, it'll be too late. Mike, can we go back to what I consider a real commodity like beef and pork and stuff like that? I mean, are we having a shortage of that stuff? I mean, is it? how does it play out? We hear more about there might be a supply chain uh, interruption to uh, the food chain. I think that's just anecdotal. What I see and hear is if you look at that, it, it's just I've never been able to get a good grasp of livestock and really good trends that, to follow to get an idea where I can predict prices. But the significance is the source of feed in corn and soybeans is very bearish and going down. And the key issues are the dollars going up and we just have too much supply. And then you look over to the biggest supplier in the world of soybeans in Brazil and their currency is plunging. So if you look at our agriculture market, that's part of it. The prices of corn and soybeans that can, should continue to climb. 
decline, partly because our dollar is rallying and there's just so much supply in the rest of the world. Mike McGlone, you covered all. Mike McGlone covers all things commodities for Bloomberg Intelligence, including Tom's favorite, Bitcoin, which is uh, supply right, demand. It it's going up, Tom. It's going up. I think you should get your computer out, get your uh, you know your your Bloomberg uh, little app going, see if you can come up with some more Bitcoin mining technology. Well, uh, yeah, we should. I mean, we should do Bitcoin, and you know, when we're done with that, we can decide if Wendy and Chuck ought to get the big back together on billions. I mean, what do you <laughs> exactly, think? exactly. I don't know. Just look at the markets here, Tom, uh, you know, kind of yeah. uh, 25 minutes uh, into the trading here. Kind of a mixed market here. S&P up a couple of points. Right. Dow down uh, 30, so no real direction here. <clears throat> NASDAQ uh, is kind of showing the strength. They're up 7 tenths of yes, saw uh, 1%. That. So we're seeing some, uh, yeah. again, some continued leadership uh, by the technology space here. Oil trading down a little bit, as we talked about with Mike here. So it's had a nice rally off of that bottom, but giving back a few percent here. We'll have more coming up. This is Bloomberg. Asset managers who seized the football boots that will help her score her first hat trick. The tech that keeps you connected. <laughs> the cozy jumpers that are perfect for snuggling up together. With a choice of ways to pay, you can make the most of family time. You can say yes when it matters most at very.co.uk. Goods and services provided by Shop Direct Home Shopping Limited. Credit provided by Shop Direct Finance Company Limited. We're all having to get used to the new normal. And at Birkbeck University, we're experts at being adaptable. As London's Evening University, we've been flexing around the lives of busy commuters for nearly 200 years. And you can find everything you need to secure your place for autumn online. From expert advice to virtual tours, a live chat with our students and course applications. Make the new normal, studying for the career that you really want. Search Birkbeck, and it's new problem solved. While most of us are looking out for each other at this time, sadly, fraudsters are trying to take advantage of the situation. Here's Chris Ainsley from Santander with advice for keeping your money safe. Phishing emails are designed to trick you into giving away personal details. Messages might be about travel refunds, delivery tracking, or supermarket vouchers. Remember, never click on links or attachments in emails received out of the blue. For more advice on keeping your money safe, visit santander.co.uk. Helen is dreaming of fighting a flock of 40-foot flamingos. But in reality, she's helping fight COVID-19 in her sleep. Like thousands of others, she's joined the Dream Team. By using the Dream Lab app, they're helping scientists speed up the search for potential treatments. I'll fight you. Keep fighting, Helen. Search Vodafone Dream Lab and join the Dream Team tonight. Dream Lab app is owned by Vodafone Foundation, an independent charity. Registration number 1089625. Full terms at vodafone.co.uk slash dreamlab. To help make the most of your time at home, tune in to sharing our top activities for social distancing. Tip number five, cooking something. We all get stuck in a culinary rut with our normal routine. Shake things up in the kitchen by trying an ambitious new recipe or an over-the-top dessert. If cooking really isn't your thing, you can always support your local restaurants by ordering out. For more indoor inspiration, search Listen From Home on TuneIn. With the NHL season temporarily on ice, now is a good time to catch up on past games. With game replay on TuneIn, you can listen to every power play, slap shot, and goal of the 2019-2020 season so far. Suter, Dakota, to Fiala, he scores! And for a limited time, it's free for hockey fans everywhere. Search classic game replays to start listening. 24 hours a day at Bloomberg.com, on the Bloomberg Business app, and on Quick Take by Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Radio. This is Bloomberg Markets with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney. Is there any bank right now in the U.S. that you think is a buy? Do you think Chairman Powell has lost the market? Jeff Bezos is no dope. What's the big change? The big question, I think, for investors is free cash flow. Breaking market news and insight from Bloomberg experts. The U.S. tariffs actually hurt both China and the U.S. Large strategics are looking to either buy or invest in innovation. Soybeans and corn have been basically at or below the cost of production for about four or five years. What we see, we see more bonds, more for you. This is Bloomberg Markets with Lisa Abramowitz and Paul Sweeney on Bloomberg Radio. 
Good Wednesday morning from New York City and points beyond to our worldwide audience. Coming up, we're going to take a look at the labor market in the U.S. We're going to get jobs data, uh, employment data later this week. Question is, are some of the layoffs that were initially temporary, are they becoming more permanent across America? Plus, we're going to chat with Tara LaChapelle of Bloomberg Opinion, get her thoughts on those Disney results last night. But first, let's go to Greg Jarrett of Bloomberg News for a Bloomberg Business Flash. Greg. Paul, stocks actually opened up and then turned mixed all after President Donald Trump pushed again to open the economy. And a report shows massive unemployment. More on that in a moment. While stocks in Europe struggled for direction, investors weighed mixed corporate earnings against dismal economic data. The dollar's up, and so are Treasury yields. We look at the numbers every 15 minutes throughout the trading day. Right now, the S&P 500 is a little changed. The Dow Jones Industrial Average is down a tenth of a percent, down 35. And the Nasdaq is up six tenths of a percent, up 56. The 10-year is currently down 16.30 seconds with a yield of 0.71%. West Texas Intermediate Crude Oil is down 3.8% at 23.63 a barrel with Comex Gold down 7 tenths of a percent at 16.98.90 an ounce. The dollar yen 106.06, the euro a dollar 813, the British pound the dollar 23.74. Uh, let's take a look. U.S. companies cut more than 20 million jobs in April, according to today's ADP report showing a record slump in unemployment. And with an economic picture like that, J.P. Morgan cross-asset strategist John Norman says equities, in his opinion, are overpriced. This is going to be an extremely abnormal recovery, meaning it's going to take years to recruit the lost output and the lost jobs. And that usually equates to uh, a multi-year process of recouping the lost profits. The S&P is now up a tenth of a percent. That's a Bloomberg Business Flash. Bloomberg Markets is underway with Lisa and Paul. Thank you so much, Greg Jarrett. We are seeing uh, the market try to hang in there despite some of the dire economic data with the ADP payrolls report showing that more than 20 million Americans lost their jobs in April, raising a real concern of how long this can go on. Dave Wilson, Bloomberg Stocks Editor, uh, joining us now. Dave, 